I hope everyone is okay with it. And um, over to, thank you, Georgina. So over to David Monday. Thank you. Thank you also. Great, thanks Nisa, thanks, and thanks everyone. Uh, I'd like to extend my uh, thanks as well for people giving up some of their evening to uh, join what I hope will be a useful and informative session. Um, so as Nisa says, I'm the public health consultant um, in Reading and um, I'm gonna do some of the kind of, uh, I guess, broader kind of context piece and then uh, Mike will come on with the specifics on surge testing itself. Uh, so I'm just going to fight with the computer to share my screen. Um, so just give me a moment while I get that to do what I want. Okay, so hopefully um, coming through, can you, does the slides come through? Okay. Yeah, fine. Okay, great. So the three bits I wanted to touch on um, are on the, are on variants generally, on where we're at kind of with restrictions and then also on the on the vaccination program just to kind of set us with a little bit of context um, and I think as has already been said we're you know more than happy to kind of take questions comments suggestions etc so um, uh, we'll um, really you know this can be as interactive as people um, kind of want it to be so if I go to my first slide, if I can get the slide to move forward, here we go. So just first of all, thinking about um, viruses and variants generally. Um, so a couple of things that are worth just noting at the offset. Um, so a virus has its own what we'd call genetic code. Um, and the way viruses behave is that they then um, will replicate if they're in in our cells because because we become infected with that virus and it's that replication process that can lead to viruses uh, changing a bit so as they kind of replicate and as they as they multiply um, that genetic code can just gradually uh, uh, gradually shift as errors occur in that kind of replication process. And in time, what that means is that viruses do change that genetic code a little bit. So that's happening all the time. It's not something we ever really think about. And a lot of the time when viruses do that, it's a harmless, um, inconsequential change, something that we don't need to worry about, doesn't uh, make any kind of notable difference, but occasionally leads to uh, a change which the body finds harder to fight off. And that's where we get this, um, these kind of variants of concern from when these replications and changes have occurred uh, and the body then uh, has, a, has a tougher job at um, getting on top of the, um, getting on top of the infection. So we regularly use subclassification of viruses to help kind of just uh, identify where different mutations or um, different strains of a virus exist. And you may have heard with the flu virus, for example, um, you may have heard people talk about swine flu uh, and bird flu. Um, and those are two examples of um, where you've got a virus, it is mutated in different ways, and you've got different kind of substrains of it. Um, and if I can just for a moment, my so one of my son's favourite jokes is um, is about is about flu. So what's the difference between swine flu and bird flu? Uh, well, the answer is swine flu um, needs ointment, whereas bird flu needs tweetment. Uh, so anyway, there you go. So we're used to different classifications of viruses in flu, and we're also used in flu to it changing a bit. And every year the flu vaccine has a slightly different strand um, kind of within within the vaccine itself to combat the any kind of recent changes or or, or mutations. So what's happened with COVID-19 is exactly the same as that. So we now use the phrase Delta variant and Alpha variant. Um, and what the, the terminology that was being used up to a week or two ago was um, the variant first identified in India. So that's the Delta variant or um, sometimes people were referring to the Kent variant. So that's what we now call the alpha one so and it's probably helpful to move away from the geography in terms of how we name variants because it may be that that's where a scientist first identified it doesn't mean it actually first mutated there because as I say mut these mutations are happening all the time um, 
so so we so and it probably doesn't help with labeling either where it's kind of labeled after a particular country or or, or, or area so um and that and those things can lead to stigma and can be unhelpful so we're now in that in in using kind of the these delta alpha etc kind of these these wordings um and i guess one of the main things about viruses then and, and about how they kind of change is that those those overall control measures and the ways that you combat them don't suddenly change when you get a bit of a variation i.e you know uh, the hands face space fresh air message which we've all kind of heard over and over and over and over again still applies it applies as much to the delta variant as it did to when we first heard about um, COVID-19 last year. So those are overall um, uh, uh, kind of ways in which we deal with the virus don't, don't change. Some things may need nuancing and that's where you can add in boosters in vaccinations, et cetera. And I'll come on to a couple of specifics where we are with the Delta variant, um, but, but the, 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 the headlines remain consistent. So um, a couple of, uh, so three things, sorry, that are key features when we are looking at any variants of COVID um, that we want to understand. So the first thing is about vaccine efficacy, i.e. how effective is the vaccine against, against the virus. Um, the second is transmissibility. So in English, how easy is it to pass from person to person? And then the third thing is how unwell it makes you, so disease severity. Those are the three things that Public Health England monitor closely. So with the Delta variant, which is the one, as I say, that uh, has previously been referred to as the variant first identified in India, um, which is the one that's causing most focus in, in, in the UK and in Reading at the moment, we know that the vaccine is a really good match for fighting uh, off that virus and um, it means that people who are vaccinated have a far lower chance of being admitted to hospital uh, and people who have been vaccinated have a far lower chance of being admitted to intensive care or even dying from vi from from the virus um, compared to people that that, that, that haven't been so it's really effective still. I think there's a few percentage points different in, in its effectiveness compared to um, the, the, the initial tests against first strains of the virus, but again compares favourably to the flu vaccine, which I've mentioned before, in terms of how effective it is at, at preventing illness. Um, we know that this Delta variant is more transmissible than the Alpha one, the one, the Kent one, the one that was kind of causing us problems over the winter. Um, I don't think anyone has absolutely been able to say yet how much more it can pass from person to person. Estimates of up to 40% more likely to pass around, but um, that's not a completely clear picture yet. And on disease severity, what we're not seeing at the moment, despite increasing case rates, and I'll show you the numbers in a moment, um, we're not seeing a sharp rise in hospitalisation, which is uh, really good news. There has been a small increase in, in people uh, in hospital, um, doesn't appear to be rising at the same rate as cases are rising, which is good. So um, I think we're hopeful that it isn't leading to more um, severe illness, but we um, can't be complacent in that. And of course, where we do still have people that are not vaccinated, they will be at a, at a higher risk than people that have received um, both doses of the vaccine already. So that's where we are specifically with the Delta variant. Um, I promised I would show a couple of numbers, but I'll keep it brief because I don't want to um, I don't want to go turn it into a kind of a long epidemiology lecture. Um, but just to show you in Reading what's happening at the top of this slide, and hopefully you can see my cursor, we've got um, a month in time and we've got the rate of COVID in Reading, which uh, a month ago was at 19. And now the most reliable data, because the last, the most recent four days, um, we haven't got all of the case numbers through, so won't quite be accurate. It's gone up to 90. So we have gone up by four or five fold over that three, three and a half week period. Um, and you can see as the numbers go up on this, on this chart, the shape goes a bit darker just to help the eye kind of see that. The rest of the table then breaks the overall reading rate down to different age bands and what we can see is that the sharpest increase has been in those aged 17 to 25 um, where uh, rates have gone up to around 200 so around double that which it is kind of in the town overall. 
um, although do look to be settling a little bit um, in that age group. And the primary reason for that will be that um, at present we're vaccinating people, we've just started vaccinating people aged 25 and over, those aged uh, under 25 won't be uh, vaccinated yet, um, and therefore they are at a greater risk of, of, of picking, up, picking up the virus. We can look at the numbers in a different way, um, and this is exactly the same measure, so we're looking at the rate in Reading over the same time period, but instead are looking by some fairly broad ethnic groups. Now, um, the absolute numbers that sit behind this can be quite small, so um, this gives a feel for what's happened in terms of how the virus has behaved within different ethnic groups in the town in the last month. But um, I would express caution about um, drawing any strong conclusions or using these numbers as absolutes. But what we can see is that um, Pakistani and other Asian uh, ethnic groups have seen a sharper rise in case rates, which again has fallen a bit now. Um, and, it's a, and it's a little bit more kind of shared between, between um, different groups. And then some of Black Caribbean and other Black groups have been... Um, uh, have seen an increase as well. And ethnicity recording is never uh, 100%. Age is a very easy thing to caption. We know it um, clearly for everyone because as people go for a test, they'd register a date of birth. But ethnicity isn't always recorded um, well and we have to kind of be conscious of that. But I think what we have seen in Reading, and when I look at the data um, from Public Health England, there's clearly been um, uh, cases of the Delta variant which have happened because of people's travel to countries where, uh, where that's um, been most prevalent, so particularly in India, but not just India. Uh, and that undoubtedly has, of course, impacted certain communities in Reading more, where there's stronger connection to countries where the variant is, um, has, been more, has been more prevalent. So that's to give you a picture of where we're at with the, um, with the numbers in Reading. Um, and then this is just a simple bar chart to show that when we look at uh, cases in Reading and look at whether they are this Delta variant or not, we can see that over the month of May, we went from a handful of Delta cases, um, Delta variant cases, to uh, in by late May over a hundred in a week of of these of this Delta variant, and that has been a mirrored picture in many parts of the country where this variant has become the more dominant strain, and that's very much been the picture in Reading. So that was the first bit about the variant and where we are right now in Reading. The second bit, just very briefly, in terms of kind of where we're at with the restrictions currently uh, and where we're going, um, hopefully this hasn't come out brilliantly on the slide, but hopefully you can see uh, the wording around the step three bit, which is the step we're at in terms of the national release from lockdown now. And I'm sure people are familiar with what the what those rules and regulations are in terms of um, not more than two households mixing indoor or up to six people and then up to kind of 30 people outdoors. And we all know from kind of being uh, in and around the town, you know, the you know, what's open in terms of, um, you know, indoor hospitality, pubs are open for kind of, you know, table service, cafes and restaurants, etc. Um, shops are open, but clearly restrictions remain in place. Um, there's a lot of speculation in the media at the moment about what will happen in terms of the 21st of June and further relaxations of, of the current rules. And I don't have a crystal ball and don't know what will happen with that. Um, but, we're, but we're assured that the government will make an announcement on Monday about, about uh, what comes on the 21st of June or not. Um, and I think that uh, if I think what's what's likely is that we don't move to just a complete kind of no restriction on the 21st of June. I think it's likely that restrictions will remain and indeed that move will be delayed, but we'll wait, we'll, we'll wait and see what's said. But I'd go back to what I mentioned before that I think for Reading, the key things are in a way kind of regardless of exactly where we're at with release from lockdown and the regulations, the key things will remain those hands, face, space, fresh air messages, because that's how the virus transmits. Those are the ways that we need to reduce that from happening. Um, and uh, we will continue to move forward with the vaccination programme to give people that uh, extra protection that it provides over and above 
um, the, those other those other messages that people need to needs to follow. Um, and uh, we will. And I think there is something about then how we will um, need to live with for a while some of those kind of ongoing ongoing restrictions or ongoing kind of guidance in terms of hand washing or, or using face masks in some settings. But um, as I say, don't have a crystal ball as to exactly how how things will fare in 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 the coming in the coming weeks. So just finally from me on vaccination in Reading. So um, this is just um, a simple chart just to show that uh, over the, so from um, March through to kind of present day, what's been happening with the proportion of people who live um, uh, in Reading that, have, that, are, uh, that are vaccinated with at least one dose. And Reading is this dark blue line here. And you can see that we've just seen that as you would expect, as the vaccine program has been rolled out, that gradual uh, ongoing increase in um, vaccination kind of uptake. And then in uh, orange is what is happening in uh, the neighbouring areas to Reading, in the um, so West Berkshire, Wokeham areas, etc. Um, and then you can see what's happened in terms of kind of England overall as well. Um, and I think the message in Reading is clearly we're lower than the kind of average elsewhere that line it's not necessarily easy to see but is coming closer to the averages elsewhere and one of the key features of Reading is that our population is disproportionately uh, younger compared to uh, to other areas so what I mean is that there's there's more people in Reading who are under 25 than you would see in average um, in um, in a town or city or any kind of area of the, of, of the UK, um, bar maybe a few a few places, which means that there's more people in Reading that haven't yet had the offer of vaccination because they're not yet at the age where it's being offered. So our overall percentage will lag behind because of that. Um, and we are then doing, and I'm not going to go into the details necessarily this evening, then some specific pieces of work to ensure that the vaccine is um, as accessible and as easy to have as possible for, for people locally. Um, the booking link, um, which is easily Googleable um, from the NHS website, is on the bottom of the slide here. And anyone aged 25 and over, uh, even if they've previously declined the vaccine, can still um, come forward for it. And that's how they most easily do so. And we continue to offer vaccination at the Medeski Stadium, as well as at three of uh, the local pharmacies in Reading, and then in certain of the GP surgeries as well. Um, and then just to say that vaccination, uh, the final bit for me then, so vaccination uptake looks different in different parts of Reading. And again, that's quite common for, um, uh, for large towns or cities where you get different levels of um, of uptake. So the map here on the left, the darker areas are parts of Reading where you've got higher uptake and the lighter areas where you have lower. And that's presented in numbers on here. So you can see uh, that there's a range where um, we go in some areas from 60% of, of, of people in that area are vaccinated down to about 30%. And the primary reason for that again is going to be age. And we know from knowing Reading that um, Caversham will have a higher proportion of older people who have already been eligible for the vaccine and will have come forward uh, and areas in central Reading will have a high proportion of younger people who wouldn't have had the offer yet. However, we do always see some differences in vaccination uptake between different areas and there can be various reasons for that. Um, but overall, the variation we're seeing in Reading and the overall rate of uptake in Reading is better than, again, I've mentioned the flu vaccine a couple of times, but is better than um, we see, for example, in, in, in flu vaccination, which is what we've hope for all along in in the pandemic response so those are the update bits from me so i hope that has been useful um i'll stop sharing my screen um and uh i will um nisa am i passing straight over to mike and we'll doing questions after or any i'm happy to do questions now however you want however you want to do it well, actually there is a question that i think um could be answered now, David, because it's got to do with your slide. Okay. So, Helen asks if on rates according to ethnicity, there is a huge rate amongst others in court. And um, can you please explain a bit more on that? Like what this or who these others are? Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's a it's a very unsatisfactory um, kind of categorization. So that will be um, anyone who doesn't fit into one of the other broad ethnic groups or where ethnicity hasn't been recorded. Um, so it's a bit of a kind of uh, a bit of a catch all of 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 kind of if you like everyone else and that is where um the kind of the recording of um of ethnicity f it falls down a bit in terms of how accurate a picture it gives us um and one of the things we know is that when we look at um our contact tracing data and we look at people who respond so about 85 to 90 percent of people um respond to the contact tracing um communication in reading i.e when national nhs test and trace or our local offer make contact when they've been identified as having a positive test to find out who their contacts are ensure that all the isolation advice is being is been given and is followed we if we look at the data on the as i say around 10 percent of people where we don't get that positive engagement a lot of nearly all of them have not just with um their the way ethnicity ethnicity is recorded but on all the other data fields haven't given information and haven't really engaged in the process when they first went for testing so what we're seeing with the ethnicity data here is that same feature where um, the rates look disproportionately high because it's it's that group that um, for whatever reason aren't quite as engaged with the COVID um, kind of uh, kind of advice that we are wanting to you know try and help people follow so I hope that helps answer the question thank you David I hope that answered the question um, and uh, so the next one is uh, sorry let me just find the question does the high number of younger people in reading explain the 20 percent take up figure of the second vaccination um so uh what we know about vaccination uptake is that it is um it is a bit uh kind of um affected by age so when we look at people who are aged 80 and over um, we have about a 90% uptake. When we look at people um, who are in their 50s up to 60, we have about an 80% uptake. And it it has dropped a bit when you go below that, although because people are still coming forward for vaccination in age groups under 50, because um, you know not everyone's able to come straight away, those numbers are, are not that stable yet. They're still, they're still increasing. Um, so there is an age element to vaccination. Um, I think primarily with the with what's happening with the case rates in those aged under 25, it's where it's because um, unless someone has a has a very specific long term condition or underlying health problem, which isn't that common in that age group, they won't have been offered vaccination yet, or unless they work in a care home or in the hospital or somewhere. Um, so it's, it's primarily an unvaccinated population. And I think also a lot of that age group where they're in employment work in um, the kind of service sector uh, type roles more kind of more so than other age groups, meaning they're in the kind of roles where people are more likely to be exposed to the virus. So I think there's probably a few reasons to why the um, why there's some higher rates within that age group. So I think it's partly explained by vaccination. It may partly, as I say, by occupation uh, as well. Thank you, David. And um, before we start with Michael. Um, is the slide also Michael's slides as well? Are uh, is that uh, you can can you share them with all of us attending to, to this evening, David and Michael? Uh, yes, I'm more than happy to share these okay. slides. If so, I if I email yes. them to you, you yeah, that'd be helpful. Yeah, we'll be able to share with everybody. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I'll, I'll do that, of course. Um. So thank you, David. Uh, and over to you, Michael. Thank you, Nisa. I will just wrestle with the slide sharing as well and hopefully uh, can you see that coming through yeah we can and uh, it's not showing on my screen as sharing what have, what have you got david have you got the it says got it, search it, testing it says search testing with your purple your purple kind of title slide oh my, my purple title slide. okay thank you it's just not um it's just not showing on mine that i'm actually sharing it uh, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Denisa, for the invitation to come and talk to you all this evening. Uh, my name is Mike Graham. I'm the head of, in my normal day job, 
I'm the Assistant Director for Legal and Democratic Services, but have been drafted into the team, into David's Silver Command team, to help on surge testing. And so I'm going to speak to you a little this, this evening about surge testing, what it means, generally what it means in Reading and what we're doing about it. And then it will naturally feed on to messages about what we want to know and what we want to tell people, which will neatly segue into the next um, bit, which is Nikki's area as well. So if, first of all, if we um, look at what is surge testing, can you see that slide, has it changed? Yeah, okay, thank you. So surge testing was a, a, a tactic which was implemented in order to investigate some of the earlier variants of concern, which you've heard David already talking about, including Kent, South African, Brazilian, Indian, all, the, all these ones which are now called Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, we're now up to. And I think this the, the first effort on surge testing was in relation to the, um, the South African variant, which was being investigated uh, in other areas, Surrey, Hampshire, and North London. So the particular thing about surge testing is that it involves the PCR test, which you may have heard of, which is the proper lab tested um, approach for detecting the coronavirus. And it's different to the home test kits or the rapid test kits, which you may have seen, you may have used. And those lab, those home test kits just give you an indication of whether or not you may or may not have uh, COVID, there's a little bit of doubt in, the, in, the, in their accuracy, but the PCR tests are very accurate and they are tested in a lab before you get your results. With surge testing, not only do you get the lab tested results and the accuracy from the PCR test, but it's also sent away to a specialist lab which does the genomic sequencing to find out whether or not there is the DNA in there, which David's already talked about, which identifies it as one of these variants of concern, rather than just telling you, yes or no, you've got coronavirus. If it's a yes, you've got coronavirus, it's able to be more specific about where that coronavirus has come from. So this special kind of um, testing then identifies the DNA of the virus, and because then that is identified, that then helps to map the outbreaks and the clusters to identify whether or not a variant of concern is spreading in an area, whether or not it's becoming the more dominant a virus outbreak in an area, and it then helps to link those cases together through track and trace service, identifying how they are spreading. So that is the particular tactic which is being employed. So we first saw uh, this testing back in about February, I think it was, um, in relation to the South African variant. And it was a big, a big item on the news at the time. And you may have seen it. It was quite local to us in Surrey and Hampshire, where lots of council staff, police officers, fire officers were deployed door to door delivering home test kits. They were dropped off. And you see in this picture here, um, the suitably uh, protected council official handing the test kit to a resident and then they came back the next day the resident did the home test kit registered it online in their own home and then they um, the test was collected the next day and go and then was couriered back to the specialist lab where these PCR tests and the genomic sequencing was undertaken so that was very good and in the in the in the Surrey and Hampshire and the early North London other areas where surge testing was used, there were very good rates, very high rates of people complying with that. Don't forget we were in the early part of, uh, of a lockdown after Christmas, where lots of people were still at home. A lot of the activities such as shopping, hospitality were closed. And it was a good way of making sure that in an area where you wanted to concentrate your efforts about finding out what was going on, you were able to get to most people. So they had really good uh, compliance rates and really good rates of return in relation to the, um, the, the surge testing tactic. Now, as we then moved on, uh, as other variants emerged, um, particularly in places like South London, Bristol, I'm thinking, surge testing changed to be less about more, less about the door-to-door -door delivery of kits to deploying these mobile testing units 
which meant that um, the residents in an area were informed about the availability of surge testing and were invited to go to the mobile testing units. And I'll come on to those because we've got those in Reading in a minute, but we'll come on and talk a bit more about those. Now, as these uh, mobile testing units coincided with um, a period of time later on in the spring when we were opening up a little bit more and people were going back to their workplaces or going out a bit more or um, able to visit other places, it dropped in terms of the compliance, not so much high numbers, we weren't getting in the sort of 80% range of people coming out, but there were generally some good um, evidence coming forward from the mobile testing units about how much the variance of concern was spreading in those particular areas. So it was still seen as a very valuable tactic. So if you've been watching the news in Reading, then last Friday you will have seen that uh, surge testing has come to Reading. And um, just giving you a couple of pictures from the headlines there, we have been asked by the D Department for Health and Social Care on the advice of Public Health England and our Director for Public Health to undertake surge testing in Reading and Wokingham. So this is a joint effort and David and Nikki and I have been heavily involved in the last couple of weeks in getting this up and running. Now, why did we have this? Um, why are we doing it? Well, um, Public Health England has identified more than about nearly, well, David will have the up-to-date figures. So I'm very broad brush here in my presentation. David's got the up-to-date figures, but it's about 100 cases in Reading. It was lower earlier on in the week because as we've gone on, we found some more from the surge testing and they've all been coming through in the system. All those cases which are now talking about the Delta variant can't be linked back to international travel. So it's not somebody say who's been to India and then come back from India where it's uh, spreading um, uh, quite widely in that area. So it means then that there is community transmission from people to people in the Reading Borough and hence why the investigation is required to track down further where this is happening and why this is happening and try and make sure that as many people as possible are given the messages that you've got coronavirus, it's a variant of concern, you must self-isolate and you must abide by all the guidance that goes with it when you're told to self-isolate and um, help the track and trace service, test and trace service with the, um, your contacts and where you've been in the last seven days, etc. So the rates now, and again here, I think the figures are out of date um, because I've heard some further information on the way home from the office on the radio, which suggests that this information is out of date already. So approximately 100 per 100,000 people is the rate. Is that about right? David's nodding, so that's okay. And I've said there that approximately 40% of those are the Delta variant, which I think was the last information which we had for Reading and is why we were doing the testing. However, on the evening news this evening coming home, there was a suggestion that um, nationally, a much bigger figure of cases which are presenting are possibly the Delta variant. And they were thinking about it could be up as high as 90. That's what I heard on the radio on the way home. So what does this actually mean? Who are we testing in Reading? Oops, sorry, um, you should be able to see that slide with the postcodes. We are testing quite a, a, a lot of people, by no means all of the borough, but about 30,000 people who live in RG1, and there are four um, distinctive postcode areas in RG1, and that's if your postcode starts RG1 with a three and then two letters, RG15, and then two letters, RG16, three letters, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And if it helps for you to sort of see it visually, if you know your Reading area, is that coming through? Um, there are the four areas there in Reading, which you will see then are basically east and west of the town centre, but not the town centre, the main shopping district railway station itself. And that's where we are currently inviting people who live or work or study in those areas to come forward and get this additional surge testing. So how do you do that? Uh, 
there are a number of sites which have been stood up in order to be able to do the surge testing. And that print is a little bit small, so I'll just quickly run through it. One of those uh, at the top is Reading Town Hall, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. Reading Town Hall was a site which was doing the lateral flow testing, sort of community testing for helping people to understand whether or not they might have um, uh, coronavirus if they needed to do it for part of their work or their studies. That has now been switched over and you can get this uh, better PCR test and the genomic sequencing that will be done there. That's why I had, I had mine done there the other day. And very efficient it was there too. And very friendly the people were there and lots of space that they had. And it's open uh, Monday to Friday, at uh, seven in the morning till eight at night. And it's open on Saturday afternoons as well from 12 until eight o'clock. Prospect Park, we had a testing station in Prospect Park, which you went to if you suspected that you had coronavirus. And then you phoned up the NHS or went on the NHS website and they advised you to go along there and get tested. That still applies, but in the afternoon now, we have a walk-up service. So basically you walk up to Prospect Park and there is a service there between two o'clock and eight o'clock. There's also an area at the uh, Reading University in Lin London Road at their campus, again in the afternoon from two o'clock to eight o'clock. If you've got a car and you can drive, then Reading University Car Park 7 has also got a, a testing station between 12 and 6. Again, um, for those people who live in the east of the borough, you might be able to walk there because it's not too far. Um, but if you can drive, um, the Thames Valley Park and Ride has got quite extensive facilities there. In fact, they've got two mobile testing units, one which runs in the morning from half past seven and another one which runs from half past two. And that's designed to catch the people who are sort of going to and from work who might be commuting. And then there are um, a, a number of sites in the Wokingham area. Don't forget we're doing this jointly with Wokingham, but you can go to any of them if it suits you. If, you're by, if you pass by that way, perhaps you've got friends and family that way and you go uh, towards Wokingham, you can go to Wokingham Borough Council's offices at Shoot End, the Cantley Park event field, I'm not familiar with it myself, Headley Road Car Park, the Microsoft Campus, and Sindelson Court. So those are all the sites which you can choose from. There's a good range there. You don't need to book in advance and you can walk in or drive in and all the details are on our website. If you want to find that chart, it's on our, it's on our website. So that's the basic information about what we're currently doing. The testing lasts for another week, so it lasts uh, not until this Sunday, but the following Sunday, the 20th, I believe that is. And we're encouraging as many people as possible to go out and to get tested. They will get the peace of mind of knowing whether or not they've got the coronavirus. You're getting the very best test there is. Um, you are helping the residents of the borough by joining in this effort to keep everybody safe, because the more information that we've got, about the spread of coronavirus, the more that we can do to track where it's going and the more that we can do to try and keep the numbers down. And obviously that avoids serious illness for people and the possibility of you know, even more severe consequences of people being hospitalized with the coronavirus. So what we would like to um, know from you as part of this uh, conversation this evening is whether or not people have got the message about surge testing. What are the issues which um, you feel or hear about um, surge testing in the community? What are you picking up? What do we ought to know about? What can we do that will help people to visit a site to get um, tested? And apart from everything else which we've done so far, and Nick is gonna come and talk to, to you next about all the efforts that we've put into communication, what else can we do to make sure this is as successful as possible? We've got one more week to go of, um, of testing. In addition to that, I would just like to also say that um, alongside the test centres which we have got standing up, we're currently working with um, Public Health England 
in order to see and the health services locally to see if we can get some facilities to go alongside a couple of those to help introduce more sites for vaccination. Um, that would be very helpful, I think, for people who currently haven't been vaccinated or who might find it easier to go to a, a walk-in service to get their vaccination. Lisa, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Michael. That's very, very helpful. Um, we're going to do the question and answer session a bit later. I'm going to invite Nikki Barton, our communication manager, to talk to us about the communication efforts that's been in place for search testing. Over to you, Nikki. Hi, um, I'm not organised enough to have any slides. I'm just going to very quickly run through That's what okay. we've done. But just to start, um, the, main, the purpose of this is for you to feedback on whether you've seen any of the communications and what other communications you'd like to see. So I'll very briefly outline what we've done, but you know, please do feedback in the chat or via the question and answer what else you think we should do. So um, we're writing a letter to everybody in the postcode areas that are part of surge testing. That letter will start arriving from tomorrow. So anybody who lives in that area, has a house in that area will get a letter. Um, Nisa will be getting those letters in, I, I'm not sure how many different languages Nisa, but there's a number of different languages you'll get in that in, at least six, I think. 11 languages 11. and we'll get it by Friday. So Nisa will have um, those letters in translation and can provide either hard copies or electronic copies of that so that people can share that with their contacts or networks. Um, we've also sent letters via schools because children who go to school in the surge test area need to take a test. And we're also writing to businesses that are in those areas because people who work in those businesses, and that could be a shop or a hairdresser's, or it could be a pub, or it could be an office. Anybody who's working in those areas should also be taking a test. So we're doing lots of letter writing. The information's on our website, we've used our social media channels, um, and we've also used our email list. So we use our council tax database. So anyone who pays council tax and has given us an email address, we're also able to email them with the information. Um, then we have some physical ways that we're sharing the information. So there are signs around town, digital signs, for example, at the Broad Street Mall, which are showing the information. And we have what we call advans. These are vans, vehicles that people are physically driving around the postcode areas that have um, signs on the side telling them about the testing. And in um, two of the postcode areas, those vans are in English and Polish. And in two of the postcode areas, those vans are in English and Urdu. But again, we can do it in more languages and it's just helpful to get feedback on whether people have seen them and think those are the right languages that we should be using in those areas. We're also doing radio advertising, so both broadcast radio and also through people. So the broadcast radio goes over quite a large area in Berkshire because it just goes out to everyone who's listening to the radio. But also if people listen to the radio through a digital device like an Alexa or their phone, then we can target it very specifically to those postcodes. So people might also hear it on the radio. And finally, we're doing digital advertising. So that means if you're on your mobile phone or your laptop, and you're reading a website, you might get an advert that comes up, which is promoting the testing. So those are kind of the, the sort of the promotional, the push communications that we're doing. We have also got some more translated materials coming. Nisa, you might be closer to this than me, but we've been working with Nisha, who will be doing us a video in Nepalese and um, some content on uh, Nepali the Nepalese radio station. And I think there might be another one, which I've forgotten another translation, but those Polish are the- and Urdu. Polish yeah, on the signs. And yeah, on and the signs. Sign. Yeah. So those are the main things we've done. Obviously we've also shared messages. Um, so for example, with RBA, um, Reading Voluntary Action and, and other local organizations so that, and through our own staff and our own services so that they can be to service users. But those are the main things we're doing. So I'm interested to know, if anyone's seen that or hasn't seen that at all, um, thinks those are the right things or not, or has any suggestions of what else we could be doing. Sorry, one of the other translations is sign language, British sign language is extremely. That's all from me, I think. But I can see lots of comments starting to appear in the chat, so maybe we go to questions, Nisa. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you so much, Nikki. Um, Considering that um, 
the weather is very nice outside, so there's not that many who I expected to be joining here. So I really appreciate all of you to spend your time here with us. Um, those who have already submitted questions, I was wondering, would you like to say them yourself and address them to the guest speakers, or would you like me to, to share the, the questions for you? Um, Christine, Shaheen, if you want, you can, and everyone else, if you can just raise your hand and then ask the questions. In the meantime, I will start with the questions that's been shared via email. Um, I think this is going to go to David. Um, can we still get COVID infection even after being fully vaccinated? And tying with that is actually another question. Um, why do we still have to do all the public health measures with hands, face and space? And uh, Bob, I will get to you after David answer this question, if that's okay, Bob. Thank you. Thanks. David? Yeah, thank you. So on the question about whether you can still catch COVID after uh, being vaccinated um, with both with both um, doses, the answer is yes, you can. Um, we uh, we know that it reduces the chance significantly. So um, your chances are reduced a lot, but they're not zero. So it doesn't create, uh, if you like, a you know, an invincibility cloak or something, which means you can't pick up the infection. We know that the vaccine is most effective in um, stopping people becoming uh, particularly unwell with COVID, stopping them needing to go into hospital, intensive care admission, and even, you know, the, the, sadly, the risk of death. But, you know, we know it's really effective at reducing all of those things. It, um, it doesn't completely, it is not as effective at stopping spread from person to person. It does do that as well, uh, but it is most effective in that reducing the, if you like, the acuteness of any illness, uh, me making it, you know, the symptoms milder um, and people feeling less unwell, um, which kind of leads into my second point, which is, oh, sorry, it leads into answering the second bit of the question, which is why do we still need to do the kind of hands face space thing? Um, and sometimes those get called in kind of in, in research papers, non pharmaceutical interventions, meaning they're not based on on drugs and medicines, they're based on behaviours that people can adopt. Um, and the reason for that then is because that even with vaccination, we can still inadvertently pass the virus from person to person because it doesn't uh, completely stop that. And we still have people who are unvaccinated who, if they catch it, even if we're vaccinated, uh, could become seriously unwell uh, with the infection. So that's why we do still need that um, those other kind of measures in place. Clearly, as a country, we're in the process of gradually wanting to release those things um, so that there's less and less restriction. Um, but that does need to be in a staged way so that we avoid as far as possible further surges and waves of of the virus. We've seen already that we've seen numbers increase locally. Um, hence, hence that kind of cautious approach is, is needed. Thank you, David. Um, I hope that uh, answered the question being uh, asked. And Bob, um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm blind. There's a lot of visually, especially elder ones who haven't got electronic forms and obviously they can't see the print. How, how are you trying to contact them? Thank you for the question. Um, Nikki, would you be able to answer that? I think in that case, it would be really helpful to have some suggestions on what we could do. So sometimes we use videos and we're looking at next week making a short video because obviously it comes with audio, you know, a voiceover as well. So that's something we could use. And we're looking at doing something next week with David and other public health colleagues. But it's helpful to know what kind of technology you do or don't use or what would be your preferred way of doing it. Um, you can request translations in Braille. But I suspect that the turnaround time on doing that would take us... We don't yet arrive in time. <laughs> I was going to say, I suspect the turnaround time on that would, would take you beyond the end of the surge testing period. Um, 
so yeah a, you know a video with audio might be uh, the, well, the, the you, most that we've got on our agenda at the moment so any suggestions yeah. welcome uh, well you could always send an uh, audio version to reading's talking news now go out to quite uh, we go out to about 120 sight impaired people in well some of just outside reading but in and around reading that'd be one method you can use um Otherwise, it's a case of, I suppose, uh, uh, how many people uh, RAB knows, that's the Reading Association for Blind and, and their outreach people can let know if they know the right areas. But uh, apart from that, the, uh, the sight impaired are one of the hardest group to actually contact in these type of situations, because obviously they don't see anything. And I said a lot of the older, older ones don't have any form of modern communication. Fortunately, uh, I've got a PC with some very expensive software It actually allows me to do that. But um, that's the best I can hope for, let you suggest at the moment. Thank you. Can I just check with Michelle, who's on the call, whether um, you recognise those organisations and have contact details or whether we need to follow up and get contact details? Yeah, that's fine. We can get in contact with them. Thank you for the suggestions. Right. Okay. So if you and I pick up afterwards we'll look at doing something that's got audio on it and distributing it to those organizations yeah the uh reading talking newspaper goes out in mp3 format thank you okay? that's great yeah no that's really helpful so michelle's yeah, got yeah. the contacts i can help make the content and we will um pick that up and see what we can get to them okay thank you Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Nikki and Michelle. Um, the next question is, why are there so many strains of virus? And ties in with that question is, how, what can we do about them? Can we stop them from, um, can we stop them from making new variants, of this virus? I think that goes for David. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's, a, there's probably a couple of bits to that answer. Um, one of the reasons that we're seeing these variations in the in the COVID-19 virus is because, as with any virus, it, it does mutate uh, and change, as I described a little bit earlier. So in a way, it's kind of behaving like viruses behave. Um, but I guess the main reason that we're seeing um, variants um, kind of increasingly uh, with COVID, maybe more than we do with some other viruses, is because of how prevalent the virus is. And just because it's infected so many people globally, it's had all of those times within all of those infected people where it's been multiplying uh, and reproducing itself, which is what leads to these changes in its genetic code happening and leads to these mutations. So whilst it is um, a virus which is so prevalent, it has the opportunity, because of all these multiple, multiple millions and millions of replications that it's done, to do that mutation. So the main way that we can stop mutations of the virus happening and not get these kind of surges of new variants etc is to control its prevalence because that gives it less opportunities to be multiplying and therefore to mutate so uh, it goes hand in glove with overall wanting to control the virus um, and stopping it spreading you know from person to person so the most important thing for that is vaccination, uh, undoubtedly, in terms of um, if you had to hang our hat on one thing. But that is then where doing the things to avoid it spreading from person to person um, uh, in that messaging we've all heard and are sick of <laughs> hearing is what still needs to happen. And that way we quash it as much as possible and give it less opportunity to uh, go on mutating. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for your answer. Um, I have a question and it's got to do with, is it the, is the vaccine safe for people who are pregnant or expecting to be pregnant? So um, it is. Um, and what happens with any um, medicine when it's developed is that um, 
all you know there's a range of safety tests that um, the researchers do to uh, check for its both its effectiveness but then you know to check for check for the safety of it and then that is closely monitored by the um, in this country it's the medicines and healthcare products regulatory agency uh, it's a bit of a mouthful the MHRA um, and they have a role to ensure that all the tests and safety has been done and then they will license uh, a medicine uh, which includes uh, vaccinations so the vaccines have all gone through that testing process um, the way that you look specifically for safety for um, people who are um, either who are pregnant or who are uh, expecting to become pregnant or trying to become pregnant is not to include them in clinical trials when you don't know how the medicine exactly works because um, you clearly it would be it would be unethical to use a brand new product um, and expose a fetus to that because that would you know that wouldn't be uh, if you, that wouldn't be a safe thing to do so instead those laboratory tests are done and then very close observation of how it affects people and then as it's rolled out in in programs um, across the country like it has been in, in the United Kingdom the monitoring is done to see if there are any adverse effects etc and obviously we've seen this question about blood clots and the advice has changed accordingly in terms of the age range uh, that people get the AstraZeneca vaccine but there's been absolutely no safety concerns around the um, uh, women having it who are pregnant or indeed as I say people who are either trying to become pregnant planning to become pregnant so um, we're confident that it's safe uh, and is certainly as effective in in that in that group of people thank you so much for your answer um, the next question I'm not sure if it's going to go for Michael or David or even Nikki um, so locals close to for example Prospect Park are not going to be in RG1 postcodes. Are those walking up being refused if they are not in the RG1 postcodes? If so, has consideration been given to other sites such as major, major supermarket car parks? Non RG1 residents could equally be filtered. I hope that question is that, clear. Yes, yeah, a good question. Um, it's uh, thanks for that question, Helen. So yes, the answer the answer is that um, Prospect Park isn't exactly in RG one. It is fairly close. People who walk up to any of the centres aren't being turned away. So we are focusing our resources in um, RG one and those those four districts because the evidence shows that is where the Delta virus was rising most quickly uh, about a week and a half ago when we were looking at the data and we decided we had to decide where were we going to test and where should be the focus of our test now we could clearly have gone uh, much wider the whole of the borough but then that would have taken um, that would have taken more um, mobile testing units to cover the entire borough we did look at whether or not we could put um, mobile testing units on supermarket car parks. In the Wokingham area, they've managed to get one, I think, on a little site. Um, we had some targeted spaces in the Reading area, but we weren't allowed to put them there by the supermarket chains. So we did try on those. And we were, um, because we're in a compact urban area in Reading, we just don't have as many big open spaces in the middle of town as you'd like. It's a town, it's a town centre. Uh, there's lots of housing, there's a couple of parks. Um, we're lucky that we've got the sites that we've got um, relatively close that we can be able to, to move people there. Um, and I wish we could had some more um, in order to place some more, some more resources there. But as long as you are, um, if you're living, working or studying somewhere in Reading, um, then they will take you and test you there. What we're doing in our messaging is asking those people in those areas to come forward and to specifically try and get those people to come in and be tested. But if you know somebody who's just on the edge of the area or in an RG2 or an RG30 or something goes into the test area, they will still be able to take the test and, and get it registered and that will be useful data. But it's just about our focus. We're focusing on those four areas because in all of the town, 
that's where we found that we were having the, the rates rising more quickly. Does that answer that question? Yes, thank you, Michael. I think the next one then would be tied in with this question. So what about disabled people within these RG postcodes? What, what if they can't reach to the search testing sites? What are um, the interventions in place for that? The next one tying in with this is, um, could there be a bus moving around and testing people within these uh, postcodes? to help increase the uptake of search testing. And a suggestion um, on a leaflet through the door would be able to alert people of the availability of this bus. So something for you, Nikki, about the leaflet. Um, maybe it's easier, you, Graham, to answer the questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, sorry, I'll let Nikki come in. Yes, I, I think it's a great idea. There's lots of, there's lots of ways to do it. One of the other ways for people who've got mobility issues who can't get out to a site is also to order the home test kit. So the details of that are on our website as well. I, I think it was on one of my slides at the bottom as well. There's a website address or a phone number. And essentially what you're getting when you go to the surge testing site is a, is a pack which we are opening and using for you, which has been previously, uh, it's the kind of kit which has been delivered to homes before in those Surrey and Hampshire areas. So it's amenable to being posted. Um, they will tell you how to get it back. You have to be able to register it at home in, in the sense of putting the barcode details into, a, into your phone or into a laptop or something to be able to connect your test sample to make sure that they know who is sending it um, and, and then being able to get the results back to you. But there is availability for that as well. But the, the idea of a bus moving around is, is, um, is, is a good one. We haven't been able to stand that up uh, this week, but it's certainly a good idea to take away. Sorry. Thank you, Michael. The next question is from Helen. Um, I think this one is for David. So concerns are being raised about car the quarantine hotel, Hotel Penta, and it's all over social media. Even suggestions that this is the source of the Delta variant in Reading. Um, Helen has seen RBC raising concerns over management and location. So can can you shed some lights on this, David? Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah, certainly. So, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of press coverage in the last 24 hours uh, about the about the um, quarantine hotel uh, in Reading. Um, and I think probably the most important thing to say is that we have got really accurate information on the number of residents and the number of staff who within that facility have tested positive for COVID um, and have worked kind of with the hotel operator, but also the kind of security firm, the Department of Health and Social Care, et cetera, to kind of manage uh, the impacts of that as, as far as we possibly can. Um, we, 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 we can see that there are a handful of cases of the Delta variant that have happened kind of in the community in Reading, which originated from that hotel, from that genomic sequencing that um, Mike described earlier. So, we, you know, as, as was said in the kind of media yesterday afternoon by the council, that has occurred. Um, when I look at all of the data across Reading, which we have access to from Public Health England, there is, it's very clear there is not a single um, source of the Delta variant which has led to the rising case numbers that we're seeing in Reading or the, you know, the prevalence of, of, of this Delta variant itself. So it's very much not the case that it's because of the hotel that we are therefore seeing the Delta variant in Reading. It has contributed in a small way to what we've seen, but as but there's a number of places where the virus has kind of cropped up and has of course um, has of course spread. Um, so the before we made the announcement um, with the press kind of coverage yesterday, there were a number of additional kind of safety measures that were being put in, in the hotel to manage things, um, and uh, which, which which clearly is a uh, what we want to see because we want to ensure people in Reading are as safe and protected from the virus virus as possible. Um, we think ultimately that hotel will close um, and, um, you know, that, but that's a central government kind of decision ultimately in, in doing so. Um, 
so I hope that I hope that helps kind of answer answer the question. Thank you, David. Um, I, I think I think so, Helen. I hope that answered your question. Um, okay, so the next one is it comes from money. Um, I think Michael already touched on this. What is what is the point of doing such testing if we miss the whole town? I think what money meant is why don't we do it for the whole town to do this? Is it just trial? And then the next is for David. Um, with all these variants that come, do we expect more virus to come? And how are we prepared ourselves with this more virus coming our way? Um, Michael, if you could start, please. Thank you. Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, I think it, I, I think it is that, uh, as I said before, we've had to have a we've had to have some um, we've had to have some opportunity to focus on where we want to do first. Uh, might there be future variants? Yes. Might there be future test uh, surge testing? Yes. It's always possible. Um, I think that what we will do from this exercise is learn very much about how effective in Reading in this area and with the, the constraints that we've already discussed around um, space for mobile testing units and the ability to communicate with a, a diverse audience in the community, how we are going to be able to um, uh, get significant numbers of people out to get tested and whether or not that at the end of the day makes an impact in terms of what we're finding are we able to test, test and trace uh, to a significantly better degree to make an impact on the on the virus and get that sort of curve coming down instead of going up? So experience will tell us if we're going to be better prepared for a next time. Um, I think as David's already explained about various different variants, no one will know whether or not there's going to be another variant of, of, of concern coming along. We've had four in a relatively short space of time. In the general media, I saw something about a, a variant which might be emerging in uh, Vietnam. We don't know if that's a, a variant which needs to be investigated here, if it's going to be a variant of concern, whether or not it'll end up being the uh, Delta Ep uh, the Epsilon a variant of concern, who knows. But the fact that we've been able to um, work with Public Health England, with Working in Borough Council, and with all our partners in the community to do this surge testing effort, means that we will have better evidence for Reading. We will have raised awareness about um, the variants of concern and testing, and we'll undoubtedly be better prepared for any future, any future variants which come to town. Thank you, Michael. I hope that answered your questions, Manny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, sorry, let me just find it. Um, if one member of a family in the same household have COVID or have the Delta variant, does the whole, uh, does the whole household need to isolate? Um, David? Yeah, so um, there's probably, so the, the short answer is yes, um, but just to give a slightly fuller answer, if that's okay, um, when people are um, going for these surge tests, so they're in the areas because uh, they live in the area they work or they study in the areas that we've described earlier in Mike's presentation. When they go for these surge tests, you know, it's not because they have symptoms, it's not because they think they have COVID, it's because we're asking them to come forward to make sure we're finding as much of the virus as possible. They don't need to isolate then whilst kind of waiting for that result to come through, because clearly the result won't be instant. It will take a couple of days to get the result back from, from NHS Test and Trace. So they don't need to isolate whilst they're waiting for that result. But if they do the surge test and it shows that they have COVID and then it's and whether it's confirmed then as a Delta variant later or not, that's when they need to isolate and then the household contacts uh, do, and they'd also be contacted by uh, NHS Test and Trace to identify if they've got workplace contacts, school-based contacts, others they may have been interacting with whilst infectious um, who would need to isolate. So hopefully that fuller answer just gives the picture um, of what it means specifically also when we're in this kind of surge testing um, uh, two-week scenario. Thank you for your answer. Um, 
we still have about 15 minutes um, to go. Um, I'm actually hoping that um, the attendees here, especially coming from the communities, to be able to let us know um, how can we support everybody in terms of us being able to deliver the search testing in the best, most efficient way and that it works with you. Um, is there anyone who can give us suggestions? That'd be very, very welcome. Otherwise, can I also, could, could I add to that, Nisa, just to say, so, you know, has anyone seen any of the communications that we've put out and, and what do you think of them? Do you think they're clear or not clear? Have you got any suggestions? I'd be really interested to know. Great. Um, Shaheen, I see your hands up. Uh, one thing is I have not seen, Nikki, I have not seen any of these, uh, you know, posters or anything uh, um, so far. So I, I don't know. I can't say anything. Uh, the other thing, I went to the center yesterday because most of the time working from home. So I didn't see anything. Uh, the other thing is I, I just suggested to uh, Michael and maybe, you know, other people can do the same thing. Just came to my mind that as Nisa, you know, in our center, there are women come from 22 different, uh, you know, countries or more than that. So and majority of them have got no confidence uh, to walk to the center and they find it so difficult to go for a test. Uh, and I've been supporting individually some of the women. Uh, and that's where I, my question was about, you know, spreading the message that you don't need to book a test. Some of the social worker are advising people to, uh, you know, book a test or they are trying to book a test uh, for them. So I, I'm, I'm trying to organize next Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday from our classes, as many women as can, you know, go for the test. So I will walk with them to the test center, either the town hall or to the uh, university, Reading University on the London Road site uh, to get uh, them tested. And that will give them the confidence probably to take their other family members uh, uh, to get tested once, once they know that what is, because people, women ask me a question, how long would, would it take? What would I need to say there? Do What question they will ask? What I need to take with me? Do I need to take my passport? So, you know, some of the people are just, just frightened. They don't, they don't know what, you know, what is expected for them if they will go there. So if there are other people who are working in the community in that capacity, so I would just encourage that if people will encourage uh, and if they can support them uh, uh, to, to go for a uh, test and that would be really a good idea. Could I just ask, um, if you've not seen any communications the council's done, how did you hear about the surge testing? Did you hear it on the news or did you hear it by a friend telling you? How, how are you hearing about it? The first, thing, the first thing I heard was in the news in the morning. Usually I heard the national news in the morning and when it comes on the south side and I heard that and I was shocked because I was not expecting anything go, will go up, you know, now. I was thinking it wouldn't be. And uh, after that, yes, I received an email. Uh, the, I received a council newsletter and uh, there are information in that newsletter. But uh, what I'm saying about not seeing is the posters. You know, you mentioned about the posters and publicity and things like that. So I, I do receive emails and I do receive emails from NISA as well. So I get the communication. But first thing I, I heard from news, uh, you know, on the BBC News in the morning. Thank you. That's really helpful. May I just add, uh, Nisa? Uh, I think uh, Shaheen's uh, uh, raised some good points there about you know the questions which people might have in the, in their mind about search testing, and the the simple answer really is they don't need to do anything um, when they go for their search test. They just need to bring themselves. Uh, they don't need any identification. No one's going to check their address. All you really need uh, to get your results is a mobile phone number or an email address, it doesn't have to be yours. If you haven't got your own email account or your own mobile phone, if you can have a friend or family's email or a phone number, then as long as there's a way in which the results can be given back to you and, so, and you could be contacted later, then that's really all you need. Thank you, Michael. Um, I saw Azra, you, did you raise your hand, Azra? Uh, yes, please. Lisa. Come in. I just wanted to add as well to what Sheen was saying and Nikki as well, that um, yeah, I was away at the weekend, I read it on the news and I haven't seen anything either, but I don't live 
in the RG1 area and on working from home. So I think the letters going home, you know, to those postcodes would be really good. And maybe um, spreading that word a bit more, because I think some people um, through like connections, you know, if they live in say RG7, they've got confused and thought that was them, whereas obviously it's RG17, let's say. So I think sharing more about the postcodes and saying a letter will be coming to you for surge testing that will spread the message and I just want to check sorry Nikki because there's lots in the um a chat about I was making an assumption was that right that the west of Reading is Polish and English and the east is Urdu and English is that correct I've just assumed that by the demographics but you know, is, I'm desperately looking in my email to try because it's two postcodes of one and two postcodes of the other yeah I, I've just been desperately trying to check my notes on my email so that I can double check um and I don't think I can confirm it with confidence here I would have to check that to make sure I've got it the right way around um I, I would just but, add to that then that they sound great you'd, you'd put Urdu, Urdu on both on, on west all as well postcodes. yeah because that's the yeah. Oxford road so that's like Polish and west and then there's, you know, and obviously when we looked at the data, so I would probably add Urdu to the West as a suggestion. And then for the East, Urdu and um, English, if they were the ones that were, obviously, they correlated. Yeah, because we could we could do more languages and we looked at it. So the government provides the adverts in a number of different languages. But what ends up happening when you've got the van going round is that... Um, if it's rotating through too many languages, then it's too long before people see a message in a format yeah. they recognise. So we're trying to get the balance. But it would be relatively easy for us to make sure that Urdu was on both sides. So I'll, I'll chat to the team about that. Great. And then maybe with the translation, schools are an option. You know, they could have some other leaflets. And then if their parents need in another language, they've got that as well, because those schools are central to the RG1, mm. aren't they? So, so they should be getting... So I said that of the letter that we're sending out, Nisa's nice getting it in 11 languages and the schools have a slightly different version because the instructions are different. So when it goes to your house, it says, please go to a test site. But in the school, it says, the school will give your child a test kit, please take it. But the schools will also receive that in all of those translated languages as well. Um, so that they can provide it in whatever, in up to 11 languages, whatever they're requested by the parents. Great, thanks Nikki. Um, Christine, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, please. Um, going on that note, um, has letters, because I live in the sheltered housing, independent living, extra care, it doesn't matter what people call it, um, but I live in one of these places and I've not seen any letters of any sort come in about surge testing or anything. Although we were getting tested once a month here, um, but I believe that stopped. I will check on that tomorrow. So it's as if we've been left in the lurch. Um, our letters go into these sort of places because uh, I know there's many of these places in Reading and they're all older people. And older people, um, I'm not being rude, but it takes time for them to understand letters of this sort. So, you know, um, they need them early so they can get people to explain them to them. Mm -hmm. So, so nobody has received a letter yet. No, oh, the, right. okay. the, the earliest they will arrive is tomorrow because we only posted them on Tuesday and they went second class. So the earliest they're arriving is tomorrow. Um, I need to pick up specifically with um, our, so in some ways it might depend who runs your facility. So for example, with council run facilities, um, a service that are running the facility are managing messages about testing. If it's not council run, then I'll have to just check um, whether they're it's, included in the letter writing or not. It's Catalyst and they run in with the council. So it's a, it's a bit of both. I think the council, um, I know the council rehouses older people to here. Um, so I believe that it's run side by side. OK, so I'll find out internally. Um, maybe, Michelle, that might be another one for us to pick up um, about those kind of facilities specifically, because I'm not sure where they might appear on the data that I was using. So perhaps we could pick that up. And now I know why you're doing search testing. I will go to the walk in session tomorrow and get um, tested, although I do twice a week home kit. 
but um, I've had both injections, but I still want to make sure I'm okay. I'm clear. I'm not going to pass on. I don't like giving anything away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine. Um, oh, I'm very conscious of time. Um, I have one suggestion coming from Kev. Thank you so much, Kev, for your suggestion. So Kev said that, can we, because during winter, we also have an increase of flu patients and going to hospital as well. Would there be possibility for us to then do a campaign on wearing masks still during the winter season? So then, um, and his reasoning is because the backlog of operations and treatment are currently at five and a half million. So surely anything we can do to lessen the load on our hospital over winter will enable us to catch up of the delayed treatment during this pandemic time. So that's from Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin, for that. Um, okay, and uh, I think we can wrap this session up. Um, if there is any more questions or thoughts coming after this session is finished, please feel free to send me an email. I will share the presentation and also the recording later on. Um, oh, sorry, Helen. I'm not sure if your question is finished yet. Um, do you want to come in, Helen? Or do you want to say it? Um, okay. Um, anyways, um, I'll, I'll please share the, the question, Helen, in email, and I'll, I'll get okay. back to you. It's, um, the question okay. is, uh, people who were vaccinated in the first wave are now potentially losing immunity? And I don't know what plans are in place for uh, or consideration has been given to autumn boosters. Yeah, I can probably just uh, try and pick that one up quickly. I think it's a good point, Helen. Um, we don't want people who were vaccinated first to, to kind of be, to, if you like, lose out at all. And we vaccinated, the people we vaccinated first were those most vulnerable to COVID. So really good, a really good question, really good point. We're not yet seeing um, that kind of um, uh, drop in uh, immunity. So in the level of antibodies that people have who were vaccinated early, and that's why we give the two doses. And that second dose really helps build the longevity of having the antibodies you need to have immunity. Um, there is definitely planning going on kind of nationally to um, look at whether booster doses uh, should run from the autumn, starting back with, just as you say, those who were, went first kind of around Christmas time um, over, over the winter gone, uh, to give a booster, and maybe that will be given alongside the seasonal flu vaccination. So we don't have a definitive picture yet, but certainly the planning towards that and the kind of research as to exactly what is needed is is underway and that's um kind of news we'll share with people as soon as we've got that as a you know as a clear kind of program so people know when they need to come forward where they need to where they need to go uh, that kind of thing all right thank you david and i hope um that answered your question helen um and thank you everyone for coming thank you so much for the guest speakers michael david nikki and uh, thank you for uh, spending your time and joining us here this evening. And I will let you know when we do have another event coming up from Reading Borough Council. So thank you and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your support. Thanks, Nisa. Thank you, Nisa. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.